Good morning, Derry, Derry Hannam. It's a great pleasure to be interviewing you for Open Democracy at the World Forum for Democracy 2016. You talk about testocracy. Yes. First of all, I'd like you to tell me what that is in one sentence, but secondly, are you surprised that there seems to be an emerging consensus at this event that testocracy has not suited education very well? Yes, testocracy. A market-driven education system that is based on private companies selling their curriculum products, lobbying governments to buy their curriculum products for their school systems, offering them to provide uh, high stakes, um, standardized tests on these standardized curriculum products, selling the collecting and selling the data to government, using this to create a teacher, school and system accountability system so that teachers can be fired if their kids don't get high enough scores in the tests or their salary increase can be withheld, head teachers can be fired, etc, etc, etc. This is all standardised. I find more and more people in education see the future lies with personalised education. These two I just don't think are compatible. If you want a personalised system, Passy Salberg from Finland has written a wonderful book, a definitive book on this, um, called Finnish Lessons 2.0, where he calls the testocracy germ. He refers to the great educational reform movement, germ, and he sees it as just that, a disease carrier that is infecting systems and wrecking creativity, teacher confidence, and student learning. And I totally endorse that view. And about the event here, do you get the feeling that, that the tide is turning against this? Job? Well, I have to say yes, don't I? I've come here. I mean, it seems to me we want schools that embody or what I want, which I've always done in my teaching practice, we want schools that embody children's and human rights and democratic practice in everyday life. Now, the Council of Europe stands for those two things, human rights and democracy, and I totally endorse that. For me, these aren't things that teachers can just talk about to kids. That's important, but it's only part of the story. The whole story has to be day-to-day -day experience of human rights and democracy in the everyday life of the school. And I want these schools to be free and initially part of and eventually constitute state systems. And I think states should support innovation in how to best create these kind of schools that are grounded in human rights and practice of democracy. I like very much the inspection-free, high-stakes, test-free approach of Finland. I admire it immensely, where schools collaborate and share good ideas. Is Finland the top country in Europe? Finland scores very highly. I don't want to go into the PISA testing system <laughs> and the PISA league tables for education systems, though suffice it to say that in the first round of tests, Finland itself was amazed that it came out top in Europe. Not against all the Pacific Rim countries, but in Europe other, it came out other top. Front, who are the other people in there? Who, in the who have done well. Yes. Um, well, Estonia, which strangely enough is linguistically very aligned to Finland, also does quite well. But Finland were the, were the clear leaders. The other Nordic countries do pretty well. The Norwegians have a very democratic, they listen to their students when they're modifying their school system. I find it very impressive. I've worked a lot with the, with the school students organisation from Norway also from Denmark, which is, has another interesting system where parents drive the system to some extent. It's possible for parents to start a school and get state funding for it. But I like the Finnish system because what's so important is the schools collaborate. They are not set in competition with each other. We're such, so pernicious in England. I would not claim to be a professional researcher. But something happened during when citizenship education was being, uh, was being introduced in England. Um, David Blunkett was the minister. His advisor, and there's a long story here, was a man called Bernard Crick, who had been his tutor when uh, Blunkett went to university. Blunkett was blind, and nothing was expected of him in terms of intellect or education. 
I think he was trained to be a piano tuner. Anyway, I worked closely with Bernard Crick. Um, I persuaded Bernard, what I've said here, that if democracy is going to work, it's got to be practiced in school as well as talked about. So into the, into the curriculum framework for citizenship in 2000 came the descriptor participation and responsible action. That was to go into the curriculum for all students in English secondary schools. They were to have the opportunity to participate in democratic decision making and take responsible action. As soon as this was published, the right wing went for blanket. The chief inspector at the time, Chris Woodhead, said this was madness. Kids would be making democratic decisions in schools when they should be learning maths. A well-known right-wing journalist, Melanie Phillips, also wrote a similar piece in the Daily Mail. Blunkett got worried politically. I said to Bernard Crick, it's OK, we can get evidence that the schools that do have a lot of participation, get better academic results, have better attendance and have fewer exclusions. I made that claim on the basis of having inspected 200 English secondary schools and that was my impression. So Crick said, can you provide some evidence? So I got given £25,000 to go and get some evidence for tomorrow so that it could be used to answer the right-wing attacks. It took me a month. And what I found, I found 12 much more participative and democratic schools than the average. So using the help of Ofsted, I interviewed teachers, head teachers, governors, students, and also ran the data through the Ofsted statisticians database. It showed that in every case, whatever the social environment of the school, because it was very important to compare a middle-class suburban school with the achievements of other middle-class suburban schools. So we had some rural schools, some inner city schools, and some suburban schools. In every case, when like was compared with like, those schools were getting better exam results right across the full range of ability than would have been predicted for schools in that area. They had better attendance and they had fewer exclusions for antisocial behaviour. And in some of the inner city schools, there have been no exclusions at all for the last five years, which is quite extraordinary. And I put it down to the fact that the ethos, the environment of those schools was welcoming, participative, and the kids felt they had a place there and a voice. The government in England, or the inspectorate, <coughs> tried to close <coughs> one of two private democratic schools, much more democratic than most. One is Summerhill, started by A.S. Neal. The other one is Sand School in Devon. At Summerhill School, the students are allowed to decide whether to attend lessons or not. Ofsted found this a shocking proposition and wanted to take away the license of the school as a school. The inspectors went in, wrote a report, the school must close. The school challenged this in court. I had a bit of a dilemma because I was an inspector, but the school asked me to work for the school against the inspectorate, which I did, and we won the case. And we agreed in future, inspectors who understood the philosophy of the school should be part of the inspection. And what was established in court was that none of the government inspectors had the first idea of the philosophy behind this school. So what we achieved was, in future, whenever the inspectors came, the school would be allowed to appoint one of its own inspectors, someone it chose, to be a member of the inspection team. This has transformed the way in which Summerhill School is now inspected. And from being a school that was told it should close, it's now getting good to outstanding ratings. Um, also, social services inspectors say this is the safest from a child protection point of view. Because the kids have a voice, it's the safest school they know in child protection terms. It would be impossible for a paedophile to practice in this school. Before you were talking about producing a remarkable evidence base for David Blunkett when he first asked you to go and get the evidence about comparing the success rate of this kind of democratic schooling with the mainstream. Yes. Um, but something has gone wrong with the politics afterwards because they didn't take any pay any attention to that evidence. And then uh, would oh, you... Oh, they did, Rosemary. They did? Yes. Well, that, uh, that's what I need to know more about because how did then the situation change such that now, if you like, the inspectorates are asking questions 
almost designed to shore up the testocracy rather than its alternative. Yes. The initial use of that piece of work, it was criticised widely for being too small scale. It was, okay. I called it a pilot study. Yes, it was yes. only 12 schools. Yes, we yes. had 3,500 secondary schools. But what Blunkett was able to say to his attackers was, um, I have some evidence that your attack is unjustified, that introducing citizenship education will not lower standards. What evidence do you have for your allegation that it will? Okay. Now, they had none. Okay. So Blanket had a little, they had none. Yes. And they shut up Rosemary, basically, yes. and left him alone. Then there was a seven-year longitudinal study of the outcomes of citizenship education. It looked very closely at the attitudes of children to political issues, to voting, etc. To me, it missed an opportunity to look at the wider implications of this approach to children, what effect it has on their whole feeling about school and learning. Mm. So in a sense, I'm a little critical of the longitudinal study for failing to pick up on the ideas behind my very small study. Yeah. I'm not saying that's why it's failed, uh, there are many reasons. I mean, it's met a wall of political hostility from the right-wing forces, let's say, that emerged into government in 2010, the Liberal Demo Democrat Party, which I would have hoped to stand up for citizenship education, didn't really understand the issues well enough, and since they've gone out of power, um, the government is going through the motions, but it's, much, it's attached much more importance to its uh, emphasis of true British values policy. Because of the success in the Summerhill case in England, I often get asked, will you come and help us with a crisis we're having with the inspectors in this country and this country? And a couple of years ago, three years ago, I think it was, I got involved in Denmark and the Netherlands. I thought Denmark would be the easier of the two because of their tradition of open schooling, free schools, parental, parental involvement in schools, etc., etc. In fact, it proved very difficult in Denmark, but in the Netherlands it was interesting. Initially, the schools, the two Sudbury Valley model schools were closed, but the people who had started the school, Peter Hartkamp, who's here, and his wife Crystal, they kept on arguing, and eventually the inspectors listened. This is a beautiful story, because they then started another school with the full support of the inspectors, and the nice ending to this story is the inspectors are now using it to train inspectors in alternative approaches to education. So that's a lovely story from the Netherlands, and I would say this would be the model that uh, Amasay should pursue.